أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على عادائهم أجمعين من يوم عداواتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقال الإمام الباكر عليه السلام في حديثه الشريف وفكر فيما قيل فيك وإن عرفت من نفسك ما قيل فيك فسقوتك من عين الله جل وعز عند غضبك إن غضبك من الحق أعظم عليك مصيبة مما خفت من سكوتك من عيون الناس إمام الباكر عليه عليه أفضل الصلاة والسلام has said in his hadith to Jabir ibn Yazid al-Ju'fi we're continuing from last night where he said that if you are accused of something remember we talked about the five things if you're accused of committing oppression don't oppress others or if you are oppressed do not oppress others if you're accused of being a liar you know do not become despondent if you are betrayed do not betray others right if you are blamed for something Right? Do not lose your temper. Do not lose your temperament. Right? In dhumimta fala tajza. That if you are blamed for something, you do not lose your, you do not become despondent. You do not lose your temper. Or you become overly excited. Rather, fakir fi ma qila fiq. The Imam says, think about what is said about you. Wa in arafta. من نفسك ما قيل فيك and if you know or recognize that there is some truth in the accusation that I have done something wrong that if you recognize that there is some truth the greatest tragedy of your life أعظم عليك مصيبة the greatest musibah of your life, the tragedy of your life, is if at that moment, when you recognize and accept that you have done wrong, or you have made a mistake, or you have committed something which is not correct, if you fear falling from the grace and the eyes of the people more so, from the grace and love, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the ayn of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then at that moment we shall know that this is the greatest musibah and tragedy of our life. Because when we realize that we have done something wrong, our first concern is with others and not the fact that I have fallen from the eyes and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is the greatest musibah in someone's life. Meaning, perhaps, there will be things that we do in our life which we are ashamed of, which we regret. But if in those moments of regret, we have a greater regret and concern for what people think about us, as opposed to disappointing or as opposed to shaming ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is the greatest tragedy and acts and um, disaster and calamity in our life. Then we know where our priorities lie, and then we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes second. That God comes second, the Imam of the time comes second, because at that moment, my immediate concern was not with the sin that I committed, but about others finding out. My immediate concern was my spouse's <coughs> disappointment, for example. <coughs> Not with the fact that I disobeyed Jabbaru Sama. Asaytu Jabbaru Sama. Right? That I disobeyed the sovereign of the universe. 
The Imam then goes on to say, or rather before that, we have to realize that very soon we will all be asleep six feet under. But Allah is Allah la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la no. But Allah is the living and the all powerful. We will all soon be taking a nap in the dust. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al hayyu al qayyum. And when we lose sight of this fact, we lose sight of our purpose in life. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Imam then says, وَعْلَمُوا بِأَنَّكَ لَا تَكُونُ لَنَا وَلِيًّا And you shall know that you shall never be an obedient lover to us. حَتَّى لَوْ اِجْتَمَعَ عَلَيْكَ أَهْلَ مِصْرِكَ Until the entire people of your town gather against you and they say, وَقَالُوا إِنَّكَ رَجُلٌ سُوْ وَلَمْ يَحْزُنْكَ ذَلِكَ And this does not disappoint you or make you sad. And if the entire people in a town come together and say that this is a righteous man or a righteous woman, this does not make you happy. Why? وَلَكِنْ اِعْرَدْ نَفْسَكْ عَلَى كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Take yourself and compare yourself or put yourself up against the book of God. For in kunta salikan sabilihi, that if you are traveling in its way, zahidan fi tazhidihi, staying away from what the Quran says to stay away from, raghiban fi targhibihi, seeking what the Quran seeks, khaifan min takhwifihi, that you fear or you, you, you fear what the Quran has told you to fear. فَثْبَتْ وَأَبْشَرْ Confirm yourself and be happy. فَإِنُّهُ لَا يَدَرُّكَ مَا قِيلَ فِيكَ Because nothing that is said about you shall hurt you. Because the Qur'an has become your standard and your guide in life. Not your spouse, not your children, not your community. They do not become the standard for whether you are a good person or a bad person. The Qur'an becomes the standard. And so often when we adulterate and change around the situation, we see that our lives end up in disaster, in spiritual disaster. Because the entire priorities of life are skewed and adulterated. That they're not in order. As I said last night, they are promiscuous. And I define the meaning of that word. Right? For those who are interested, think about yesterday. We defined it as a kind of disorder. When we mix things that don't belong together. We do ikhtilat of things. Mixing things and ideas that don't belong together. We do it out of ignorance. We do it because we think we know better. We do it out of our own opinion. We do it out of our cultural biases not based on the risala and the rulings of the Qur'an and the Ahl al-Bayt as, as taught to us by our marja, by our scholar that we follow. But when the priorities are disturbed, the soul is disturbed, the heart is disturbed, and then all of this will do nothing. It won't bring about any change. It won't bring about any revolution. It won't bring about any reformation. It'll just be another Arba'een 
and we move on from that and we go home when we have our dinner and that's the end of the story and we come back to cry next year. And at the end of the day, what do we have to present the Imam of our time with regards to change? The Imam is not necessarily looking for us to say, well, I attended the majalis, yes. But what did I do with that? Did the Quran or the Ahlul Bayt become the center of my life? Or do my children and my spouse and my friends and my boss continue to be the standard by which I judge whether I am doing a good job or a bad job in life. This is precisely what Imam al-Baqir is saying. And he's saying, Ya Jabir, the Quran must be that centerpiece. And if it is not, then we have lost the plot. We are off the track. Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in Surah Yunus, ayah 57, Ya yuhannas kad ja'atkum mu'idatun min rabbikum. That O mankind, an admonition has come to you from your Lord. Wa shifa'un lima fi sudur. And it is a healing for what is in the hearts. And it is a guide and a mercy for the believers. And I will ask a question. And as I am always with my students, I am very frank and I am very straightforward. That is my style. If you don't like it, then you know uh, you don't have to invite me again ever. But I'll be very straightforward. Is the Quran a healing for us? Is it a guide or is it a mercy? What relationship do we have in, with the Quran in order for it to be any of these three things to us? A healing, a guide, and a mercy to the believers. If we are believers, do we have any of these three connections to the Quran? If we do not, then we have to ask ourselves, do we have a right to identify ourselves as believers? Or again, was this all just a cultural ritual and exercise that has gone on? Ahlul Bayt, and this is the Arba'een of Imam al Hussein. Peace and blessings be upon him. Expects something very great of us in order for us to receive the reward of this arba'in. And that is for our hearts to change. For our consciousness to change. For our lives to change. That if I do not observe hijab, on the day of the Arba'een, I make a promise to Imam al Hussein saying that I will not shame him and his family on Yom al Qiyamah by leaving with this pledge incomplete and broken. If I'm not praying my, saying my prayers, then I will not leave this Arba'een until I tell Imam al Hussein, for whom we have gathered, that I will not shame you on Yom al Qiyamah. I will not disappoint you on Yom al Qiyamah. When we want to be gathered with the liwa of Hussein, when under the flag of Hussein ibn Ali. But we cannot have that honor without first fulfilling the responsibilities. And each and every one of us know what we need to work on. It's not for any one person to judge the next person. That is between us and God. But if we don't make that change, then we have to ask ourselves, what was the use of this exercise? Secondly, when the Quran becomes a healing, a mercy and a guide for the believers. 
two things must occur. First, through reading the Quran and thinking about the Quran and relying upon a scholar who knows the Quran, an alim, a scholar, a mufassir, we learn to evacuate those negative attributes from our heart and fill our heart with what the Quran expects of us. This is known as Al-Takhliya wal tahliya Evacuation and filling. That this process must go on when I read the Quran, when I interact with the Quran. There must be something that I remove and something that I contribute to myself. There has to be a constant exchange going on between ridding ourselves of certain weaknesses, sins, bad habits, and infusing and filling within ourselves that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger has told us is for our own better. Salu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that is why Amir al Mu'mineen says in Khutbah in Al Kafi in the ninth volume, he says, Ya Yuhannas, innuhum man nasaha lillah. That, O oh mankind, the one who devotes himself to Allah, wa akhada qawlahu dalila. That the one who dedicates himself to Allah or herself to Allah and takes the word of Allah as a guide for their life. Meaning the Quran is not just something that they recite at a wedding. And even then, why Surah Yasin? I don't know. There are so many other surahs to recite at a wedding. Surah Yasin is about Jahannam and the, the limb speaking. We said Surah Rahman, Surah Najam. It's almost as if, I don't know, the community, at least the weddings that I've been to, it's as if sometimes some of the brothers or sisters don't know anything but Surah Yasin. So how can the Quran become a guide for our life when we only know one Surah of the Quran? And maybe Al-Fatiha and Kulhu Allahu Ahad, Surah Al-Kawthar. How? There are 114 Surahs. If only three or four of them I know, and maybe I know the meaning of two. Maybe. How can the Quran become a healing, a mercy, and a guide to me? It can't. Yeah. And then, what happens? What is the substance of my deen? What is the substance of my wilaya to Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad? Where is it? It's not there. Because the Shia were who fought of the Quran. The followers of Ahlul Bayt were all who fought. They were memorized the Quran. In fact, they were known to be Ahlul Quran. What made them Shia? Was their intimacy with the Quran. And through that, they found Ahlul Bayt in the Quran. Can we find Ahlul Bayt in the Quran? Do we know where Ahlul Bayt is in the Quran? Inshallah, some of us do, and if we do, may Allah SWT give you opportunity to learn more. Inshallah. If we do not, then we have to ask ourselves, what's the poetry for? What's the matam for? Without the pillar of the faith, which is Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation, the wahi of Allah, kalam Allah, the literal word of God, the uncreated word of God, or rather the created word of God, for the Ash'ari it is, it is uncreated. <coughs> what is the use? So when the Quran becomes a guide for our life, a middle moment he says in Ahjul Balagha, Inna hadha al-Quran yahdi lillati hiya aqwam. That the Quran guides to a path which is so firm. It's not mutazalzil. It's not shaky. 
Because when someone holds fast to the Quran, of course, by holding fast to the Quran, they hold fast to the wilayah of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Al-Yawm akmal tu dinakum. Today I have perfected for you your religion. By holding on to the Quran, they are holding on to Ali. Right? Ali al haq wal haq ma Ali. Right? Ali is with the truth and the truth is with Ali. And the misdaq of the haq is a kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm not saying Quran only. That's not what I'm saying at all here. No. Don't, please do not misconstrue what I'm saying. But when we hold fast to the Quran in this way, our deen becomes qayyim. Firm. Not shaky. Or as a middle mu'mineen says, that this is a Quran which is an advisor which will never cheat. It is a hadi which will never misguide. It is a guide which will never misguide us. وَمَا جَالَسَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ أَحَدٌ That no one will interact with this Quran. إِلَّا قَامَ عَنْهُ بِزِيَادَةٍ or نُقْسَانِ Either that they will leave this Quran, that after they finish interacting with it, they will either, either be increased, that they will increase in their spirituality, or there will be a decrease. They will either, as he says, they will either be more guided or they will be less blind. There are only two options for the mu'min, for the Shia. That when they interact with the Quran, either their religious knowledge, their spirituality, their humility, their prayer, their character improves, or their ignorance is reduced. If neither of this happens when we are with the Quran, then we are not with the Quran. And we are not with Ali and we are not with Ali Ali. Because this is exactly what a middle moment is saying, is saying in Ahjul Balagha. This is the Imam in his own words. And then we wonder why Allah says in Surah Taha 165, قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى That the person will say on the Day of Judgment, My Lord, why did you raise me blind? وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا I could see in this world. But why now on the Day of Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, I've been raised blind? Because the noon of the hidayah of the Qur'an, the light of the guidance of the Qur'an did not enter my heart. It was not a part of my life. It may have sat on the mantle above the television or on the bookshelf, but that's about it. And thus I am raised blind. Thus I am denied the shafa'ah of Ahlul Bayt. I am denied their love. I am denied their mahabba. They are ashamed by me on the day of Qiyamah. And the enemies of Ahlul Bayt will come and they will say, Na'udhu Billah, if this is the case. Inshallah, this is not the case for anyone here. Inshallah, this is not the case. <clears throat> The enemies of Ahlul Bayt will come and say, Ya Ali, Ya Fatima, at least our followers knew the Quran. Your followers knew a lot of philosophy, a lot of love, a lot of great words, but the fundamental aspect of their deen, which is the book of Allah, is missing. And thus we are told in the riwayat, these are riwayat which are acceptable, that the Shia who have a missing link with the fundamentals of Islam, as Imam Sadiq says, will bring shame to us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because they claim to be Ja'fari. To be the followers of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, Imam Sadiq says this. So inshallah the light of the guidance
guidance of Allah and his hujjah, the imam of our time, will enter our heart. And of course, we know that the light of the imam of the time cannot enter our heart. As Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasani tells us, one of the greatest scholars in the entire Muslim world, he says that the light of Imam Zaman cannot enter the heart of the one who does not recite Quran. This is based on the ahadith as well. He says 50 ayat a day. And without the light of the Imam entering the heart of the believer, where is the shifa'a? Where is the intercession? Do you see how intercession is directly linked to Quran? These are not my words. You can look at the books of the Maraja, the lectures are online, they have said this. Ayatollah Wahid al Khurasani, many, many other great scholars. May Allah give them a long life and protect all of them, inshallah, our mujtahideen. Then the Imam says that once someone has the Quran, they shall be self-sufficient. Then he says, فَاسْتَشْفُوهُ مِنْ أَدْوَائِكُمْ وَاسْتَعِينُ بِهِ أَلْوَائِكُمْ That by this Quran, seek healing for your illnesses and seek its aid during difficult times. فَإِنَّ فِيهِ شِفَاءً مِنْ أَكْبَرِ Because in it is the greatest source of healing or in it is a source of healing from the greatest of illnesses. Is it a heart attack, cancer? What? وَهُوَ الْكُفْرُ وَالنِّفَاقُ وَالْغَيْبُ وَالْضَلَالُ That in it is the greatest healing from disbelief, hypocrisy, transgression, violation of the wajibat, meaning violation of the risala of my marja. Because how do we know? How do we know what's wajib and what's haram? Unless we're much there. Unless we know everything for ourselves. We don't. Unless someone does here, then all the more to them, inshallah. May Allah give them more knowledge. That the standard for this has to be the book of laws published by our marja, by our source of emulation. It's not a do-it-yourself job. Right, as the Aima have said, uh, that the one who follows a deen according to his ra'i is mal'un from us. That his mercy is removed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَيْسَ مِنَّا It's not from amongst us. He's from the others, but not from us. The one who follows a deen according to his or her arbitrary opinion, which is not based, grounded on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. These are very well known. I mean, this is, this is you know, Dinyat 101, bottom, you know, the, the foundation of religion. So the book of laws of our marja has to be the foundation of us knowing whether we are in a state of disobedience or obedience. Not our back home ways, not our culture, Unless it's a culture of Islam and the culture of obedience to the Prophet, that's a different kind of culture. So we have to ask what kind of culture do we operate? And that applies to every aspect of life, to our business life, to our home life, to our worship, to our purity, to our impurity, to our dietary restrictions, to our hijab, to our clothing, to our covering for men and women, to the places that we attend to, the gatherings that we can attend and the gatherings that we cannot attend. Because Islam is a deen, it is a way of life. And the Quran speaks to every matter of our life in a general or specific sense. Because God loves us, He has not left one aspect of our life without a sense of guidance. Because God loves us. And that's why God says in Surah Zumar 23, Allahu nazzala ahsan al hadith, that Allah reveals the most beautiful of work. 
كتابا متشاب كتابا متشابحا مثاني this has a long discussion هذا البحث طويل but i will explain very briefly it means that part of the quran explains the other part of the quran right tafsir al quran bil quran this is one way of understanding which the ulama explain but now what happens now i believe the quran is the most beautiful word how can it not be it is god's word god's revelation god's communication to creation what happens allah says تَكْشَعِرُوا مِنْهُمْ جُلُودَ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ That the skin of those who have the awe of God tingles from this Qur'an. That the skin shivers because of their attachment to this Qur'an. This is not the hadith, this is the Qur'an speaking itself. Allah Himself speaking. ثُمَّ تَلِينُوا جُلُودُهُمْ then their skin becomes soft. وَقُلُوبَهُمْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Then their skin and their heart become softened to the remembrance of God. Meaning when I come and I say one verse of Qur'an, you are thinking to yourself, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, have I implemented this? What about this? I don't know this. That I leave so concerned that I hang on to every letter of the Qur'an. I grab onto it, I hang onto it. I want to treasure every letter. This is what God is saying. It's not the hadith, this is Allah speaking Himself. So we have to ask, what is our relationship with the book of Allah? Is it as Allah and Ahlul Bayt have wanted and desired from us because they love us, because they want to guide us, because they know what is better for us than we know for ourselves? This is again an ayah in the Quran. Or have we forgotten? And inshallah, with the help of Allah, I will remember and you will remember. Then the Imam says, فَاسْأَلُوا اللَّهَ بِهِ وَتَوَجَّهُوا إِلَيْهِ بِحُبِّهِ Ask Allah with this Qur'an and turn to Him with the love of this Qur'an. That when we turn to Allah, we turn to Him بِحَقِّ هَذَا Quran. For the sake of this Qur'an. Accept my, my repentance because I love your Qur'an. I love you and I ask you to forgive me for the mistakes or the moments of indiscretion in my life. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Wa la tas'alu bihi khalqa. And do not use it for the purpose of appearances in this world. I can't translate the word literally because it won't make sense if I translate it literally. It means don't ask people with it, but that's not what it means. It means don't use it for the purpose of worldly advancement. And on this note, our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq alayhi salam, has said, that the reciters of the Quran are of three types. <coughs> Type one, there are those who recite the Quran in order to get the pleasure of a wealthy king or government. That they use it to seek the favor of the kings. Meaning they will come into the court of Ibn Ziyad or Muawiyah or Mutawakkil and Mal'oon and they will recite the Quran in order to get money or in order for the king to like him. And so the king likes him that he will give him or her, well actually ladies didn't come to recite Quran in those days, so him, money, political power, privilege. So this is the first kind of reciter. Obviously this person is not a good person. The second one are those or who fought, like Shimon, like Omar ibn Sa'ad, like Ibn Ziyad. They had all memorized the Quran. Like the early Muslims who took the rights of Sayyidah Zahra in the middle of Mumini. وَضَيَّعَ هُدُودَهُ وَأَقَامَهُ إِقَامَةُ الْكِدَحِ 
and they violate the orders, the borders of this Quran. That they have memorized the Quran, but they violate the prescriptions of this Quran. What greater violation can there be than ripping the shirt from the back of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? For with the very same person that had memorized the Quran. Fayyad al Kashani gives us an amazing meaning. He says that it means to fire an arrow, yani iqamatul kidah, from the word kadaha. Okay? It's a, it's, it's a very old word in, in the Arabic language. It means to have an arrow without feathers. That when someone memorizes the Quran or even a part of the Quran, but does not follow through in their life. Their faith is like an arrow without feathers. That when it fires, it just goes down. It has no direction. Ahlul Bayt, when they use words, they're very, very specific. They have a very precise meaning to them. Ya'ani nabadahu wara'i dhahrihi. That the person has thrown the Quran behind their back, as Fayyad al-Kashani says in Al-Wafi. What greater throwing of the Quran can there be than the rejection of Al-Yawm Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum Wa Atmamtu Alaykum Ni'mati Wa Raditu Lakum Al-Islama Deena That what greater rejection can there be than those who shook the hand of a middle mu'mineen and at the death of the Prophet were the same ones to slap Sayyidah Zahra. And to kick her. And to take her son, which was in her womb. However, the question comes to us that when we remember these things, do we ask ourselves, what have we done with the Quran? Have we abandoned the Book of Allah? Remember, Sayyidah Zahra addresses the Ansar. The Muhajirun and the Ansar by saying, Taraktum kitab Allah, wa nabathtamuhu, wa ra'adhuhurikum. That you have abandoned the book of Allah and you have thrown it behind your backs. So we have to ask ourselves, yes, that was history. And yes, it is important to remember. But what have we done with the Quran? What has my family done with the Qur'an? What have I as an individual done with the Qur'an? That we can speak about Shemar and Umar ibn Sa'ad and these enemies of Ahlul Bayt and yes, we're not saying we're like them. No, these people were the most, um, uh, you know, treacherous of people. But it's not enough to talk about them and not think about what our relationship is with the Qur'an. That's the second part of the equation. So for example, if I have a marital dispute, is my first resource the Qur'an and Sunnah? In order to learn what kind of akhlaq I should have with my wife and my children and my neighbor and my friends? Or is my first answer, for example, well, this is the way my father did it back home. Or this is the way my mother taught me. It may have been right, may not have been right. But do I have a litmus test or a standard to return to? A marja, a source of reference. That's the meaning of marja, it means a source of reference. Something to return to, to hold on to, a reference manual. Or do I just say, as the Quran says, tell them to believe, and they say, well, we do. We follow the ways of our Abba, the ways of our fathers. And Allah says, and most of your fathers do nothing. I'm not saying that about our fathers. I'm this is about at the time of Jahiliyyah. Yes, we rely on the traditions of our family, but the traditions of our family are only worthwhile insofar as they fit within the litmus test of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. <clears throat> if they do not fit within that, 
then they cannot be a marja for me. They cannot be a source of reference for me. And if we don't know, we should ask scholars that know. If we don't know, we should refer to the book of practical laws or the books of akhlaq, which are now in English, so many of them, like self-building of Ayatollah Amini, 40 hadith of Imam Khomeini, in wonderful English. So many words. Marriage and Morals in Islam by Sayyid Muhammad Rizvi. Numerous, numerous works. There's no shortage in English. The question is, are these our resources or is our first thing to say, well, this is how I did it back home. And this is how we know whether we fall into the group of Ahlul Azimah, the people of determination, or whether we fall into the group of people who have a flimsy kind of love, mahabbatun, a kind of love. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the third group of people, the sixth Imam tells us, The third group of people are those who take the medicine of the Quran and they apply it to the sickness of their heart. That this is a group whose relationship with the Quran is such that it is applied to their daily life. The humility that Allah asks of us. The salah that Allah asks of us. The charity that Allah asks of us. The strength and courage that Allah asks of us. The sacrifice that Allah asks from us. All in the way of Allah and the Ahlul Bayt. That through obedience, love, and commitment, I and you, we together build a tower of virtues using the Quran and the Sunnah. We build a building of virtues. We build our life block after block, brick after brick, using the Quran. Using the Ahlul Bayt, reflecting upon the sacrifices of Ahlul Bayt and asking ourselves, have I appreciated the sacrifice or not? What is one of the greatest spiritual illnesses? There are so many Amrad al Qulub. One of them is to have love for someone or something other than Allah and His Messenger. And and those that are in authority from among the Ahlul Bayt. Shams Tabrizi, the famous mystic, says something interesting. He says the Quran is Ishq Naame. It is a love letter from God. That for the believers, the Quran is a manifestation of God's un infant infinite love and compassion and mercy. Thus he decided to reveal some of his word to us. Do we think of the Quran in this way? As a love letter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As Imam Ali says, that turn to Allah with the hope of this Quran. Right as Allah says, وَمَا نزلنا عَلَيْكَ هذا القرآن لتشقى. That we have not revealed this Quran to you to make you miserable. The opposite of this is litas'ad, so that you shall be happy, so that you shall be glad, so that your heart shall be nourished. Your families shall have nur. Our relationship shall be strengthened. Not to make us miserable. If it, the recitation of the Quran and the reading of the Quran makes us miserable, or makes us bored, or makes us tired, or makes us lazy. We have to ask ourselves, what is the sickness in my heart? 
And where is my love for Hussein ibn Ali, whom on that night before his death spent the night in Quran? And really, I think this is a crisis in our communities. This is a crisis. This is a pandemic in big communities and small communities. The estrangement, the ghurba that people have with the Quran. You know, I was in a gathering of community leaders in a city and someone had passed away and the presidents were there and secretaries and treasurers and all, all men in the room. Most of them between their 50s and 50 to 70 years old. All of them Shia. So they wanted to recite Surah Al-Mulk for the deceased. Believe it or not, no one could do it. No one could do it. Or either they would make so many mistakes that they were so shy to do it. What is going on? And this is a huge community. I mean, this is a community that has resident alims and scholars and things going on. And these were leaders of the community. Ashraful Jama'ah. This is a pandemic. And if this is not a musibah for us, then I don't know what a tragedy or tribulation is. How can we even beat our chests in a situation like this? Or if we do beat our chests, we think about the musibah of our own life as we are beating our chests. We beat our chests in order to evacuate that ignorance, in order to rid ourselves of those weaknesses. And then imagine the meaning of matam. It takes on an entire new meaning an entire new significance and symbolism. And I think in my humble opinion, and perhaps deficient opinion, and viewpoint, that this is what the Imam of our time expects from us. This is truly what Allah expects from us. Allah and His proof, which is on this earth. Salu ala Muhammad wa Ali. For the believers, the Quran is not a book of asatiyah. It's not just a book of stories and parables. It's not a book that just contains ma'lumat, information, and figures and facts and things to memorize and names and places. It is not just a book to recite at a wedding or at a funeral or maybe at the beginning of a program, which alhamdulillah is a very good sunnah that you are doing. Because I've been to some places where they don't even recite the Quran before a program. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the strength and tawfiq to continue this practice, inshallah. But the Quran is the kalam of God. And because it is God's self-disclosure to creation, the believers want to bring their souls into conformity with the Mashiach and the will of God and the haq and the truth that they desire every day to take their souls and to form their soul in such a way that every day it is closer to what Allah has expected from us in the Quran. That every day their soul is shuddering and moving because it wishes, it's mushtaqa, it's longing for the Qur'an. It's longing to be closer to the Qur'an. And this is the attribute of the Shia of Muhammad wa Ali. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali. As the Prophet has said himself, I think this is one excellent standard to know 
whether where we stand with regards to the Quran and the Sunnah. The Prophet has said, this riwayah is very famous, is narrated by Sayyid Ismail al-Sadr in his Sharh of Dua Makarim al-Akhlaq. It's a famous riwayah on which the Ayatollah Sayyid Ismail al-Sadr includes this in his book for those who are curious as to what the resources are, the resource that I'm using. La yu'minu ahadakum that none of you shall believe, the Prophet says, hatta Allah, hatta Allah wa rasoolahu ahabba ilayhi min nafsihi wa wuldihi wa malihi that none of you shall believe, and this includes myself at the beginning, none of you shall believe until Allah and His Messenger are more beloved to you, and I include myself in the you, than His own self, than His family and His wealth. Do we love Allah and His Messenger and the commands of Allah and His Messenger more than our own interests? More than our family? More than our wealth? If so, then we are, inshallah, believers. If we do not, inshallah, we will struggle to be better. And then the meaning of silmun liman salamakum wa harbun liman harabakum harabakum that I am at peace with whom you are at peace and I am at war with whom you are at war takes on an entire new meaning. Al-ma'na al-jadid. An entire new significance and meaning. And then we ask ourselves, this is a day of Arba'een, when is there the time to change if not now? If we can't change tonight, today, when are we going to? Inshallah we do today. Don't tell ourselves tomorrow, don't say tomorrow, this is kasal and mitah, procrastination and laziness, which is among the worst and most despicable attributes. Right? These are the things that the believer wants to remove from their heart. This is a part of the takhliya, not the takhliya. A part of the evacuation. Not the nourishment. So inshallah, I and you and we together will try to form ourselves according to what Allah and His Messenger expect from us. Salaam ala Muhammad wa Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Allahumma Imam Sadiq then says that these people who take the medicine of the Quran and apply it to the sickness of their heart are those who stay up at night with the Quran. They are made thirsty by the Quran. That in the night he stands with it in his place of prayer. In the night he is away or she is away from their firaj, from their bed. Why? Because they are with this Quran. This is Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. That their lips are dry because of their communication with the Quran. Not saying not to go to work. But with the time that they have. With their family with their friends, with their loved ones. Does the Quran have a role? If it doesn't, then we ask, what is the jewel of our gathering then? What is the centerpiece? Why not when we, when we get together as friends and family for dinner, why don't we start with Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Al-Rahman, Surah Najaf? Why, why not? Read it in English if you want together as friends. How hard would it take, 10 minutes? 15 maybe? Imagine the barakah and the blessings then in that dinner. Even if it's not a wafat, even if it's not a wilada, if it's not a birthday of an imam or a, or a death anniversary. Why do we have to wait to these times? Imagine how our dinners with friends and family or get togethers would change with the Quran being the centerpiece of that gathering. And then of course the meanings of that Quran, the meanings of those words being applied to our life. 
صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وبأولئك ينزل الله تبارك وتعالى الغيث من السماء and it is because of these people and their relationship with the Quran that Allah brings relief from the heavens for wallahi لِهَؤُلَاءِ فِي قُرَّاءُ الْقُرْآنَ عَزَّ مِنَ الْكِبْرِيتَ الْأَحْمَرِ Because the Imam says, by Allah, these reciters of the Qur'an are more honorable and more rare than red sulfur. Of course, this is a reference to the Ahlul Bayt. As Amir al-Mu'mineen says, لَنَا كَرَائِمُ الْقُرْآنَ That the most beautiful part of the Qur'an, the choiciest part of the Qur'an belongs to us, the Ahlul Bayt. So one, this is a description of the Ahlul Bayt, and two, it is a description of their followers. I'll now briefly talk about the events which led up to the day of Arba'in. We are told by Shaykh al-Saduq that the life in prison was a difficult one for Ahlul Bayt and Shah. We are told that the faces of the women of Ahlul Bayt peeled because there was no roof over their prison. As Saduq, Raisul Muhaddathin, tells us this in his riwayah. He says that they had no cover in the day and the night. They were put into an open air prison. Before they left Sham to go to Karbala, Imam Zainal Abidin had to plead with Yazid al Mal'oon to get their private belongings back. Brothers, these words will break our hearts. He said, He says, We are not asking you for something which was gifted to you. That I'm asking for something which you have taken from us. Do you want to know what Yazid took when Imam Rada said, That the possessions of Ahlul Bayt were robbed. The possessions of Imam Al Hussein were robbed. Right? As we know, his shirt was taken, his turban was taken, his ears, his rings were taken. That even the earrings of Abu Fadl al-Abbas were torn from his ears. He says to Yazid, مَغْزِلْ فَاطِمَةِ بِنْتُ Muhammad." That in that is the mill that Fatima would use to make to make flour. وَمَقْنَعَتُهَا In there was the veil and the hijab of Zahra in the hands of Yazid which is most probably the makna of Sayyidah Zainab or Um Kulthum. That in the hands of Yazid was the hijab and the veil of Sayyidah Zahra. Wa qiladatuha and the necklace of Sayyidah Zahra. Wa qamisuha the blouse of Sayyidah Zahra. Imam Zain al Abidin had to plead with Yazid to get this back. But the most important of all of this was Ra'sul Hussein, was the head of Hussein ibn Ali. You want to know what Yazid told Imam al Hussein? How he responded to him? When, uh, rather, when Imam Zain al Abidin asked for the head of his father, Yazid told him, Amma wajhu abik, falan tarahu abada. He says, As for the head of your father, you will never see it again. Imam Zain al Abidin had to plead and plead and plead with Yazid. Eventually, Yazid returned the head. He returned the necklace, the blouse, or the shirt and the veil of Sayyidah Zahra. The women and children left Sham, according to many reports, 
Their first visit was to Karbala. Before returning to Medina, they stopped to do the ziyarah of Abu Abdullah. They went to Karbala. They began to cry. They began to hit their chests and their khudud, their cheeks. They began to do ma'atam at the qabr of Abu Abdullah. So the sunnah of that ma'atam goes back to the grave of Abu Abdullah. And imagine Sayyidah Zainab arriving in Karbala, jumping off her camel, running to the grave of Abu Abdullah saying, Wa Aha! Wa Husayna! Finally arriving at the grave of her brother. Allahu Akbar. The riwayat which are sahiha, which are authentic, tell us that she began to hit her face over the grave of Hussein ibn Ali. <laughs> because she knew that this was the same Hussein that she saw when she was standing on the tilla on the, on the hill. When Shimur Jal soon al Sadrihi and Shimur had jumped onto the chest of Hussein. Holding that sword and dagger to the neck of Hussein ibn Ali. Qabitun ala shaybati biyadihi. Holding the beard of Hussein ibn Ali. Remember it was Zainab who had to witness all of this from the hill. When she came out of the tent, I ask a question. What was going through the mind of Zainab when she finally arrived in Karbala? Basim Karbala tells us in a beautiful poem, Wasalla lakum ya Abu Fadl. This is Sayyidah Zainab speaking. She says, Oh Abu Fadl, we have arrived. Wala jitta tanazzaluna. But you have not come to take us off our horses. Hayyarulus jitnaha. That these are the heads that we have brought. And we have come to get help from you. Rasul Hussein, some holy. But forgive me for the head of Hussein. Tarahu mukassira asnama. Because the teeth are broken in this head. Musibatun laqdaru uhjiha. That this is a tragedy that I cannot utter. Ruhi tamar marat biha, that my soul will not let me to talk about it. Isma minni ta'liha bitashtil dhahab kasarha, because it was with the golden plate that Yazid shattered the teeth of Hussein. Yazid utanduruhu ayuni, because my eyes saw Yazid do it. Allah la'anatullahi ala Yazid. They finally returned to Medina, Ibn Tawus relates <coughs> that before they arrived, Bashir ibn Khadlam asks to go into the city to announce the shahadat of Abu Abdullah. Bashir goes into the city, he says, Ya Ahl Yathrib, Yathrib, la muqamu lakum biha, qutila al Hussein. He says that all the people of Medina of Yathrib, there is no more place for you. Hussein has been killed. Well, just a minhu bi Karbala mudarrijun. And his body sits in Karbala. It is covered in blood. Wa ra's minhu al qanat yudaru. And his holy head has been ushered from place to place on a sphere. The women began to scream. They began to hit their cheeks. He says, فَلَمْ أَرَى بَاكِيًا أَكْثَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمِ That I did not see more people than that cry than I did on that day. وَلَا يَوْمٍ أَمْرٌ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْهُ And there was no day like this for the Muslims. Then Imam Zina Abideen comes out of his tent. دَاخِلًا فَخَرَجَ وَمَعَهُ خِرْقًا He comes out of his khayma, out of his tent. And in his hand is a, is, a, is a napkin to wipe the tears from his eyes. And he says, Qutila Abu Abdullah al Hussein wa Itrata. That Hussein has been killed and his family has been killed. Wadaru bi ra'sihi fil buldan. And his head has been paraded. 
ليلٍ فم سيدي دو سيدي من فوق العامل السنان on top of the spear there can be no happiness after this then he says فلقد بكت السبع الشداد لقتله and the seven heavens cried over Hussein البهار بأمواجها and the seas and their waves والسماوات بأركانها and the skies and their pillars والأرض بأرجائها and the earth and the trees and their branches all of it cried over Hussein we are told brothers and sisters that when Umm al banin was brought the news in Medina, Imam al-Sadiq tells us in an acceptable riwayah, كانت أم البنين تخرج إلى البقي فتندت بنيها أشجا ندبتا that Umm al banin left her house, she went to Baqi, to the grave of Rasulullah, and she began to recite a poem. The people gathered around her. She said, La tad'uni wake Umm al -Baneen. Do not call me Umm al -Baneen. Tadkirini bi ruyuth al -areen. For you remember me as the den which kept the lions. Kanat munun li. Ud'a bihim. That I had children, I was known by my children. وَالْيَوْمَ أَسْبَحْتُ وَلَا مِنْ بَنِينِ But today I have woken up. يَا أُمَ الْبَنِينِ لَبَّيْكْ يَا أُمَ الْبَنِينِ She said, today I have woken up and I have no more children, so do not call me أُمَ الْبَنِينِ أَرْبَعَةٌ مِثْلُ النُّسُورُ الرُّبَى That there were four like a hundred eagles. كَدْوَاسُلُوا وَالْمَوْتِ بِقَتْعِ الْوَطِينِ and they each met their death with their jugular veins severed. Their earrings were torn from their ears, from their body parts. And all of them lost their flesh from puncture wounds. She says, Ya layta sha'ri akma akbaru. She says, I wish I knew that there was more that meets the eye in what they tell me. Because of the right hand which was cut off my Abbas. Imagine the ground of Baqi shaking. Ya Umm al -Baneen. Imam al sadiq said even Marwan ibn Hakam began to cry on that day. Umm al -Baneen continues in another poem. She, she says, Ya man ra'a al Abbas karra ala jamahir al naqad that all he who saw Abbas attacking the throngs of the hypocrites. And behind him was the children of Haydar. And every lion possesses a seventh vulture, meaning every lion must die. I have been informed that my strong was struck on his with his hand on his head. Wayla ala shibli. She says the anguish for my lion cub. Amala bi ra'sihi darbul amad. Because his head was struck with a pole. That his hopes of the water bag were on his head. And it was struck with a pole. Lo kana seifuk fi yadik. لَمَّا دَنَا مِنْهُ أَحَدٍ If you had your sword in your hand, not a single person would have approached him. Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Umm al -Baneen. Let us remember tonight the ladies of Ahl al -Bayt, The ladies who had to return to Medina with their children gone. The ladies that had to return motherless today. The ladies that had to return knowing that their entire hair and eyes were seen by those who shall never see it. And they returned to Medina, and Medina was <coughs> never the same after this day. <laughs>
kung saya alam mo labi na dalam mo ay mong kalabi ng talagang. Ma, ito mo Hussein. Yeah, Hussein. Yeah, Hussein.